Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're going to be talking with Alfred Lomas, CEO and founder of Inner City Visions, who has really developed a whole series of approaches to addressing inner city poverty in collaboration with others. Alfred, thank you so much for helping us to understand your work and for sharing it with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Alfred, let's just uh, let's just uh, set up uh, set this up. Historic South uh, South Central Los Angeles is a seriously disadvantaged community with 32 percent of families uh, living in poverty. Uh, uh, a significant number of residents, 50 uh, percent, not in the labor force. Education levels are extremely low. You've got a lot of challenges that the community is coming together through your organization and through others. Uh, to address, could you just give us a, a, a sense of the setting that you that you found when you created uh, Inner City Visions, and and what is the situation today? Right. Well, there's a couple couple questions in there, right? But how we started. Well, one is that it's really based on my experience as a child, uh, early early uh, childhood trauma. I was uh, a victim of um, physical, emotional uh, abuse and abject poverty. And out of that, um, you know, later in life, because of the violence that I had seen in the home and outside of the home, uh, created a pathway for uh, a negative lifestyle. So, um, you know, at the core of that was uh, uh, PTSD, uh, mental health. And then so when we really look at what I just described, obviously, it's complex trauma, as social, social indicators or social work will tell you. So we know that there's a lot of layered uh, uh, challenges related to uh, the experiences and mental health. So a lot of what we see in urban areas is uh, uh, very similar to what my experiences were. Uh, they're they're um, because of the, the complexity related to uh, both in the home and outside of the home uh, has, is extremely challenging to uh, provide uh, uh, at the core of, of every child's life should be safety. Everyone should be removed from fear. The unfortunate reality in urban core areas uh, is that the historic trauma, in addition to the historic violence, um, has created uh, really, in many cases, for those that uh, oftentimes are involved in violence, uh, is a ge- cycle that's uh, generational and, uh, and very complex. So we created a number of interventions related to early intervention, being able to work in a collaborative model uh, with uh, licensed clinical social workers, uh, advocates, uh, but also individuals that are from the community of Los Angeles. Our entire staff uh, is from the area. So we're, we, we uh, exemplify what grassroots should be. Um, and grassroots is um, our peer-to-peer model, which is children from the community as well that have graduated our program, are now able to then uh, uh, identify risk factors as well at their peer group. So we've been able to really create a comprehensive model that is able to uh, what identify through uh, some of the social indicators and risk factors that we see. There are certain data points that are very important in our work. Uh, an example let's, of that. Let's pause there for a second, Alfred, because okay. we're going to come back to that. Um, I'd like to go back to your initial point, which had to do with the language to describe what you experienced and what sure. other people experience yep. in their lives. Um, because sometimes language helps and sometimes it's a barrier and sometimes it's both, right? Right. So we talk about PTSD, right? It's an, acro- it's an acronym. Um, you know, it's, we, we talk in clinical language, but really it's the same words. They're different words for the same kind of thing, right? Somebody as a young person has learned as they're learning the way the world works, they are learning certain lessons and they absorb those lessons and start behaving according to those lessons. And it turns out that those behaviors, that anger that they've learned, those habits that they, that they've acquired as children, as those little sponges, Mm -hmm. right? Those things bring them into conflict with society, with elders, with the criminal justice system, they've learned that behavior through that treatment, right? Yes, absolutely. So as I was saying, as a young, as a young child, I was um, 
uh, had experienced a lot of uh, violence in the home and outside of the home. So, um, so by the time you learn violence, right? You learn violence, you learn treatment of others through that experience. It's just like any other child. And, and as, as you grew up, you had to teach yourself by looking at the world, other lessons, right? To be a different way than you learn to be. Yes. So I, at nine years old, I was uh, smoking marijuana. I was self-medicating. Uh, and that's really if we stop and think about what for pause for a second, um, you know, back, back in uh, the early seventies, late sixties, when I was a child, uh, no one knew what self-medication medication was. No one knew what trauma looked like. No one knew what, um, you were just a smoking an illegal substance. Yes, exactly. Yes. And, and what happened was that, uh, that was a lifelong journey of unpacked, untreated mental health. Uh, so no matter how well, and, how well intentioned folks were to try to help me at the core of that issue was mental health, PTSD, general anxiety. And I'd hold down a job for a short time and go back into uh, being triggered emotionally and start self-medicating. So if we look at also in, in uh, historic trauma in communities, again, in urban areas, we'll, we'll see that uh, also that there's what they call subcultures, right. Of, uh, of violence. Um, you know, gen- there's great hardworking folks in these communities uh, in the subculture of gangs. Uh, violence is normalized in the subculture. So when we start to see what that journey looks like uh, in, in terms of the normalization of violence, not only is it normalized, but it works. Where survival uh, in, in violence are one in the same. And there has to be a cultural change in order to interrupt a lot of what we're seeing from the mental health perspective, but also culturally. How do we how do we uh, change the culture for uh, young kids where violence isn't normalized? And these are some of the uh, strategies and interventions that we've developed through the years that have been very effective in one, keeping kids safe, but two, also being able to change the culture by being a grassroots agency that's able to uh, train and equip uh, staff that can be beacons of light and demonstrate healthy behaviors, right? Uh, know itself, uh, what it is to regulate emotionally, how it is to advocate and provide intensive support uh, econ- for the economics end of it, mental health, and also be able to have someone to uh, just stand shoulder to shoulder with a lot of folks that are uh, experiencing uh, crises as a result of just a number of challenges that we're seeing now with COVID. This is such, an, such a helpful thing that you're doing here, educating me and helping to, to educate others, because what you're saying is, is that these, these, um, these things that people do to self-medicate, to um, how a culture of violence can actually work, right? Yes. Um, and how um, you learn behaviors that you then promulgate that kind of work given the circumstances, right? You, what you're saying is that you have to help the person who's acquired those habits, those ways of thinking, to find other ways of thinking instead of expressing yourself through violence in order to get your point across you express your yourself through words, right? You you emotionally regulate, and you try to figure out a way that that a different set of behaviors can work for the person. And only once that is absorbed by the person itself, do you create change, right? Absolutely. Well, you know, one of one of the um, uh, the centerpieces of our work uh, is our multidisciplinary team. So what you described as well was that. There's a, there's a number of very specific roles and responsibilities that the uh, multidisciplinary team has. So on the forefront of that is the licensed clinical social worker that's able to evaluate, you know, oftentimes you can have a child that's ADHD or uh, is, 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 so evaluation for the mental health is very important. Again, as a young child, I was never evaluated. There was no kind of services. So here I had untreated, untreated mental health. Nobody Again, listened to you, right? Nobody, nobody listened. And then there's a, the demonization, whether well, they're all the same, they're all going to be the same. 
um, you know, there was that the uh, the ability to really access uh, mental health services, and even at a community level, uh, some of the barriers related to that uh, culturally. You know, uh, a lot of hardworking folks in marginalized communities, just hard, decent working folks. A lot of it's been grin and bear it. You know, even as a Hispanic, you know, we grew up. You know, hey, just go work, do what you got to do. Uh, there's a lot of cultural barriers. Even you know, studies show in, in uh, people of color, African Americans, Hispanic, that um, it's oftentimes the cultural barriers that uh, prevent individuals from seeking help. So, at the core of what we do, in addition to having mental health and working together, we all have to, we all work together and have collective input in our safety map for our families and for our children. Uh, for our parents, uh, we actually have case uh, family case management, so it's uh, the entire family. But what we do is um, there's also the the mental health component where where I come in as well as a as an advocate from what they call lived experience. So I often start out with my story as a child, um, all the challenges that I experienced in life, until I actually said, "Hey, I need help," and this is what help looks like. So it's very important that we have lived experience, folks from the community that are able to advocate and really stand shoulder to shoulder with our clients uh, in this journey. You know, for me, I, I, um, I was often told, hey, well, all you got to do is bootstrap, you know, just work hard and do what you got to do. Right. And um, I did the best that I could. But unfortunately, that was like trying to run a marathon with with uh, chronic asthma you can't breathe but you're just trying the hardest that you can so that that analogy is really what we're looking at in a lot of uh, is that we 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 have to have the, the the mental health component in place right then we also have to have the advocacy piece in place then we then we're able to really work and map out what that safety plan looks like um, and at the core of um of our our program is the economics component, right? And the empowerment piece. Because what does that look like for families to, uh, most most families are trying to navigate the challenges related to the economics uh, and how, how difficult it is for them to even, uh, uh, especially in Los Angeles with transportation issue, crime issues, violence, uh, the mental health component. There's a lot of families that we've known through the years and I can speak through the experience of you know, 20 plus years of doing this work that, where oftentimes uh, children that were impacted by violence negatively weren't in school because of anxiety, because of unpacked trauma. Let me get let me get back to that, because I do want to ask you a question about that. Um, but I do want to ask a, another question first, which is that it, let's say I'm a very good social worker. I know my craft. I know the psychology side of it. I know the clinical side. I'm very empathetic. Can I help members of your community? Could I help you as a younger person? Am I as qualified to help you as a younger person compared to you helping you as a younger person? Am I, am I as qualified? How will I be encountered in your neighborhood right. by, by an earlier you? And yes. will I be positioned to actually do as much good? Well, you know, I, I will, I got to start with by saying this. Um, I'm not a clinician, right? Not a social worker, first of all. And I'll speak a little bit more on what my role is in addition to the mental health advocacy, which is more in the public safety model, keeping kids safe and keeping the gangs away from the kids. And I'll speak more about that. So the reason right. is that in our multidisciplinary team, right? It's important that, uh, so the short answer to your question is no. Not in high crime communities that are ravaged by violence and trauma. I would say the short answer is no. The models we've been able to develop as a multidisciplinary team, a grassroots agency that has relationships in the community, each person knowing the roles and where the handoff is, yes, absolutely. It so takes I'm a village. I might be good it, within the, the context of the workflow and all the things that have to be done, but I might have particular roles. I might be suited, right, as a white guy who came out, came out of a different background, but has some expertise. I might be suited within to, to play certain roles better than others. And, and, and that's, that's what teamwork is about. Teamwork yes. is about 
you know, you have to kind of kind of recognize the the attributes that will be accepted and the attributes that can help and then put together a team. And that's sort of what you've done at InterCity Visions, isn't it? Yes, that's exactly what we've done. Uh, we've also, we, that's exactly what we've done. And there's also a training component for the clinicians in terms of what children have experienced. Uh, again, that example of my lifestyle of, and the normalization of gangs. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to explain a little bit more with a challenge. Um, what I generally explain is that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the gang. Most people go, oh, my gosh, how, did he just say that? Right. Um, because most folks coming in will see someone and say, well, if they're in a gang or they're high risk from a gang or even if they look like they're in a gang. So a lot of uh, uh, inner city work is heavily riddled with stereotypes, closely held assumptions and opinions. There's no doubt about it. So the training is really about challenging those closely held assumptions and then really bringing uh, awareness specifically to what that journey looks like, oftentimes for kids that are um, uh, marginalized, involved in, in crime, and involved in gangs. Now, the reason I said that there's really nothing wrong with a gang, well, there isn't. What there is wrong with is violence. There's, it's inherently wrong to hurt someone or harm someone. That's what we agree to. But there are studies that show that less than 5% of people involved in gangs are violent. So that tells us 95% of kids, 95% of kids are just trying to survive. So when you have one or two individuals in a community that are creating virtually all violence in a community, because it's generally one or two guys, um, the entire community becomes criminalized. So what there is a lack of is strategic, intentional, services related to public safety. When we start to see how we approach violence in the community, historically it's been, we send law enforcement in and it becomes us against them. So what, we, from stigma to, uh, you, you, what you're saying is that you shut down solutions by creating labels and stigma and additional trauma rather than dealing with the fact that you have uh, uh, um, people who have who have gathered together in a community that that is defined by a gang, but these but people aren't trying to function in a way that doesn't work for them. If you can find a different way that works, which is basically what inner city does, right? You can basically take that same person and help them uh, function in a different way, not necessarily within the context of a gang, but as a context of a, of a community member and and uh, focusing on on a job that does not involve criminality, does not involve um, uh, uh, these behaviors that, that that are so very damaging. So let's talk a little bit about what you where you were going. You were going about you were going to jobs. So I'd love to talk with you about how you help people create a different path that moves into the job workforce, um, uh, creating different skills of communication that are not connected to violence, but instead verbal uh, communication that are about executive function skills that are needed for jobs. Talk a little bit about your work there. Absolutely. Well, it's looking at, it's looking at the barriers for uh, clients that, um, again, are in high crime communities. I, right. I do. I, before I do talk about that, I do need to finish on the uh, on my role in keeping kids safe because that's very important. And we've defined it as a two pronged model. One is public safety, is keeping kids safe uh, in our certification and training. Well, we we do gang mediation, we do safe passage, which uh, we do hotspot strategy, uh, and that's that's only accomplished by individuals like myself that were former influential gang members have now become influential now for positive, but we also are certified. We're trained, we're vetted. There's accountability. I say that because there are other groups that are do similar work, but they're not trained and they're not vetted and they're not. Um, uh, so there's some challenges related to the professionalism of this work. Right. Um, we've, we were able to create actually, uh, a training academy as well uh, to to certify individuals to do this type of work. But really, in a nutshell, what what my role is is there's two prongs. Prong one is public safety. 
interrupting violence. And I can explain a little bit of how that works. It's very simple. Then the other piece is direct services, support services. So you can, if we look at high crime communities, we, um, we'll, you start to see that the, the largest, the biggest barrier challenge for any area that's experiencing violence is the breakdown of a community. There's a lack of investment. There's a lack of business investment. Schools shut down. People are living in fear. And there's a huge breakdown that occurs with that. And out of that, mental health as well, vicarious trauma, people hear helicopters, and they think that. So when we really start to understand the importance of being able and the public safety role model for us and community-based services is that we have to start de-escalating tension in the community. And the best way that we're able to do that is credible messengers. I'm from the community that I serve. Everyone knows who I am. They know I've been clean and sober 25 plus years. I'm trusted by the community. What I'm able to do is work in hotspots, gang hotspots. It's data-driven. Whenever there's homicides that are occurring, as a credible messenger in prong one, we go to the families and provide victims of services. We help them um, with mental health. We, there's also funding to help them bury uh, with their loss. But what happens is historically, we had social workers from Orange County or other places, and they're not going to that noisy, that noisy house in the block, by golly, because there's somebody drinking on the porch and they're going to come with you know, a platoon of law enforcement. What we've been able to change that is the culture is that we've been able to say, hey, look, we work in the community and we can advocate for your families. Plus, we're trusted. What that is able to do as well is if we look at uh, what drives violence in urban communities, a lot of retaliatory violence. If you look at uh, some of the major hubs, you, we know that. The, but we also know that rumors drive violence. It's not uncommon to have a person killed and someone says, oh, it might be an internal killing. Say, well, it was the guys down the block. There's rumors will just wreak havoc. I've been doing this work so long, I can tell you. There's, we've seen car accidents where there's news helicopters around and folks think that someone's attacking already because the level of fear that's in the community and that drives violence. What we're able to do, and I'm going to finalize this. I'm almost done with this. What we're able to do is go into these hot spots. We know how rumors work. Where if we get a phone call, hey, we heard, you know, A, B, and C was killed. You know, more times than not, a lot of these killings are either drug-related or they're personal disputes. There's actually a trilogy in, in, in homicides. It's either drugs, money, or women, which is crimes of passion or dis disputes related to um, those issues. So very little of it is actually gang-driven. And what happens is we're able to um, provide services to the victims was generally are going to be people that retaliate. But we also we also work in rumor control. We also know in 24 hours, generally violence happens. We also know that we can keep a, uh, individuals uh, kind of an arm stance, like, hey, let's cool things down right now. Let's provide services for the family. Let's bury them. We've got a good chance of preventing it. So this isn't this isn't an enforcement role, but it helps in terms of, of keeping the peace, right? It's it's not something that 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 law enforcement is equipped to do. It's not it's also not something that somebody from outside of the community like I would be equipped to do, no matter what my technical skills are. Right. It is something that that the community members themselves, people like yourself, can do that would just it, it it's a really important part of trying to have a more peaceful Los Angeles and a more peaceful civil society, isn't it? Absolutely. I'll land on this final piece because we have data because data matters. It, uh, data matters. It's not just conjecture, opinions and emotions about how excited I am. Data matters. So in 2012, we were asked by public health to be a part of an initiative um, in, in, in the area that we're from. That area was identified by the state of California as having uh, been dis disproportionately represented in, in violence, health, negative health outcomes, it was off the charts. Um, so they had some funding related to a violence reduction initiative. And I was opening up the park from a certain time to, in the summertime, we know violence is up and we know the kids are not engaged. We deployed as credible messengers into these hotspots. We said, hey, look, um, you're able to come to the park and enjoy yourself, but no writing on the walls. Let's do what we got to do, A, B, and C. And, you know, most folks in the community, 
if they're willing to allow their children and families to enjoy a park, if it's communicated and messaged properly. And what had the results of that uh, evaluation was that, get this, there was a 43% reduction in murder and violent crime. 43% unprecedented. We took that same model a year later, took it to the local high school, the, the collaborative model that was experiencing some of the highest levels of violence in the entire Southern District of LA. Three years later, it's the safest school. What, what this is, a public safety approach Kids have to feel safe. People need the, we need the safety component. Law enforcement does their role. They need to do their role. We do our role. And what happens is we have these incredible numbers that we're able to keep kids safe. They're positive. We can replicate them anywhere in the country. And then what happens is now we get the second prong, which is a service delivery model. We can get into what that looks like because at our location, we're on Florence Avenue. We're less than a stone's throw away from where the sparking point was for the uh, 92 riots. The reason why I tell you this is that we have never had one instance of a threat from a boyfriend, from a gang member, from anyone in the community. We have our walls aren't even spray painted because it's all relational. That's the community based model that we've created that is extremely successful in our partnership in working with the schools, working with the churches. And now working to the point that you just mentioned, the economics piece. What we created was a work source site for our uh, families. So a lot of the families that were uh, cannot navigate traditional transportation systems are able to secure work permits and work at our location as they build up their resumes and as they continue to work and then be lost into traditional work services. So we have over a 90% success rate based on program retention and job placement. So what you're, what you're saying is so very important, right? There is no opposition that is required between um, the, the mix that includes um, uh, enforcement and mediation. It's all part of one whole um, uh, situation where mediation can reduce enforcement but understanding that that there may all there may also be at times when enforcement is required right it's it's a combination it's not one thing or the other yes it's, and and most important on all sides is that the sensibility comes from within the community and not from outside of the community if enforcement or mediation is seen as being alien to the community strangers, people who don't know, you're not going to necessarily get the acceptance on either side. And that's part of what you bring, that credibility that your life story allows you and the life story of, uh, of others. Let's go into a little bit of the services that you provide in addition to some of those that you described. If you were going to break them down and categorize those services, yes. what services uh, discreetly? Well, um, so we have a logic model, our theory of change, right? As it relates to what we call intensive support, right? Well, we, we know that we, we, we're framing it as the hierarchy of needs in the community. So mm -hmm. if we look at complex trauma, violence is a starting point. So reducing violence and working with those that, uh, and families that are uh, oftentimes engaged in that uh, dysfunctionality. But you work with the whole family as well as yes. the individual? That's, that's a, we work with the whole family. It's, okay. And it's important for us to work with the whole family. What we, find, what we found you know, through the years is that oftentimes um, services are trying to fix a kid when the reality is the entire family is in crisis. And we, uh, we know as well that oftentimes there's families that will have someone that just came out of prison or someone that just lost their job. Sometimes, you know, more times than not, if not always, these are hardworking folks that come to uh, secure services. Folks that are just struggling and need a, uh, oftentimes just a, a helping hand. And that helping hand can often shift really the difference between them be becoming uh, homeless um, and oftentimes losing their jobs. If it's sometimes so we've been able to do and look at very practical, simple things like oftentimes they may have a light bill that needs to get paid. Um, and what happens is if a social worker, there's no lights on, kids get taken away. We've had instances where uh, they may have needed a new bed, and these are working folks. 
And, you know, everyone, our, our whole value system right, is that everyone needs can use a helping hand. And, you know, I'm no different or anyone is removed from actually having the helping hand. So we have our whole team that's able to really map out part of the safety plan. How do we keep people, uh, families in compliance? How do, how do we keep families intact? How do we keep kids in school? So it's really looking at this holistically. And, and you're consulting with the family. You're, you're, you're working with the family out of a place of respect. Yes. Right? You're, not, you're not seeing that family unit as they function today as a problem, right? What you're, what you're basically saying is there may be a way that you can take your skills, your sensibility, your loyalty to, toward each other, your mutual support, and there may be a way to exercise that that is better for you. And, and let's talk about that, right? But, but not in a condescending way, right. your own experiences, Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that's really the game changer in a lot of this. What I mean by game changer is that, you know, um, when when clients or individuals come in and secure services uh, or they're referred through by a local school or some of the park services, uh, even social workers uh, will refer clients to our, our location. Uh, they're constantly amazed by uh, that we're that we're, uh, we're actually in the corner of Florence and Compton Avenue. I mean, and that. People are walking in and out. We're not a parachute program, for lack of a better word. I mean, we're community-based. Then what happens is um, when we look at um, really the, the devastation of what abject uh, uh, poverty can do, because po- uh, you know social work, they also indicate that it can be a trauma. Uh, it, it can be as a, as a trauma for individuals as well that have experienced abject long-term generational poverty. So really having folks that are from the lived experience that are able to really have compassion that, that and, and, and just genuine um, uh, concern and sensitivity uh, has really been the game changer because we also understand that um, in order to help folks, right, it's important for us to realize what our journey was like. And that allows us then when we build this relationship up because everything is relational, everything is, you know, we, we live in a society that is, you know, we look at even at grants, for example, for the DOJ, everything's transactional. It's paperwork, paperwork, checking off boxes, and everybody's running around trying to check boxes off. This is not transactional as it is relational. And that's really the foundational piece for uh, really for our values as we engage clients. So lived experience, community-based. And then it allows us also when we develop these relationships of really having some really honest conversations, right? And about having what, what does financial security look like? What does it look like to, to have a, a checkbook, a balance of checkbook? What does it look like to do? Just a few things that can shift really the entire trajectory of an individual with financial uh, as, we, as we move forward. And really all that is, is that's my lifestyle as a kid growing up. I had, I was later learned these things in life. And today I am, you know, who I am today because someone took the time to explain them to me. Well, and you are the person who is explaining now, and those people to whom you are explaining, who you are helping, who are you, who you're, you're guiding, will be the guides for the future. Alfred Lomas, uh, CEO and founder of Inner City Visions, you've really shared a, a, a real window, uh, such a valuable window into the expertise of a community to help themselves and your work is is so uh, important to us all. Thank you so much. Please thank your staff. Please thank your funders. Please thank your clients for the contribution that they are making to making this th- this country stronger. And and uh, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Absolutely, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, thanks again. And have a great day.